Let me ask you something. Why don't people trust their instincts? They sense something is wrong. Someone is walking too close behind them. You knew something was wrong. But you came back into the house. Did I force you? Did I drag you in? No. All I had to do was offer you a drink. It's hard to believe that the fear of offending me is stronger than the fear of pain, but you know what? It is. Welcome to episode four of An Invitation to the Invitation, a limited chronological deep dive of the 2015 suspense drama written by Phil Hay and Matt Manfredi and directed by Karin Kasama. I am your host, Jim Panola. On this show, I start by reading a scene or scenes from the original script, followed by an analysis of those scenes, subsequently discussing the differences between the screenplay and the final cut of the film, ideally shedding light on all of the unique components that contribute to the movie and how each of those elements fit into the greater thematic ideas of the story. Let's begin with a reading of pages 21 through 26, picking up directly after the main character, Will, has seen his close friend Ben get slapped by his ex-wife, Eden, who apologized almost instantly and without much awareness or acknowledgement of how strange and intense it was. Will, now alone, takes a look around the room, his friends talking together, him separate. Will's point of view. He sees David, off by himself, speaking into his cell phone. David is hunched over, furtive seeming. He snaps shut the phone, looks out the front window toward the driveway for a moment. As he turns, someone grabs Will's elbow. Come sit with me, ask me a question. Claire leads him to the stairs, pulls him down next to her. On the stairs. Will looks across the room. David has joined the others, but glances back at the front window again. Claire prods Will out of his distraction. I mean it. Ask me something. Okay. How's work? You're up for tenure, right? She smiles at him. Yeah, I got it. A year ago. A year ago? Really? Had a party and everything. UCLA is stuck with my unbelievably gloomy seminars for the foreseeable future. At least until the oceans rise and swallow us, which is soon. I'm sorry. About... You don't have to be sorry. You're here now. They watch the party for a second. It's weird to be here, isn't it? She leans her head on his shoulder, a gesture of sisterly familiarity. He seems grateful for it. I don't know why anyone would call your teachings gloomy. Me neither. Headlights play across the front window. From where he sits, Will sees a car pull in. It wedges itself in the remaining space in the driveway, locking in the other cars. The car door opens. On the stairs. Maybe that's our hero, Choi. David has seen the car arrive too. He goes to the front door and opens it, calling down to the man in the driveway. Who's that? I don't know. At the door, night, Pruitt arrives, embracing David. Pruitt is a very large, imposing man, but with a sweet face. The vibe of a reformed Khan who has found religion. David turns, presenting him to the room. Everybody? This is my friend Pruitt. Pruitt doesn't make a move to greet anyone. Instead, he just stands there, taking in the group, as if sizing them up. Evening. A shriek. Sadie comes bounding up to Pruitt, leaping onto him and kissing him. All right, darling. I couldn't believe it till I saw you. You're really here. They hug each other for a moment, oblivious to the others. Finally, Ben makes a move. Hi, I'm Ben. Nice to meet you. They shake hands. Will notices the same leather bracelet on his wrist, the one Eden wears, and David and Sadie. David clasps Pruitt on the back. My man, glad you're here. Someone want to get my friend a drink? 
I'm on my way. What can I get you? Anything diet is fine. Ben dispatches himself. It's great to meet you, Pruitt, but frankly, where the hell is Choi? Choi? My asshole boyfriend. Hi, Gina. He promised me he wasn't going to leave me hanging. It was going to be early, made a big deal of it. It's fine. I'm great with it. Oh, David, he didn't call you guys, say he was going to be late? David shakes his head. I assumed you were coming together. We haven't seen him. That's it. I- I'm going to try again. She pulls out her cell phone. You guys have service up here? No, almost never. On Will's face, this registers. David was on the phone moments ago. Sorry, the bills fell through the cracks while we were away. We never had them come out here to hook the landline back up. It's just a little weird of him. He usually at least calls. David moves over to the door, behind Pruitt and Sadie. You could try calling them from the deck if you're worried. That's your best chance. And he deadbolts the door and pockets the key. As David turns back to the party, he meets eyes with Will, sees Will looking at the deadbolted door. Everything okay, Will? Why don't you just leave the key in the door? It's like a fortress in here. David shrugs. You know, just a month ago, there was a home invasion further up the canyon. This couple was terrorized. It was really sick. Everybody around here was freaked out by it. I never heard about that. Then I'm sure it didn't happen. Yeah, come on, Will. Can't a man put himself in lockdown if he wants? This is America. You guys should have a gun. What if there's a fire? Kira catches his eye, mouths the words, give it a rest. David smiles calmly and unlocks the door. I just keep the house a different way, Will, that's all. It's my house. Eden puts a hand on Will's shoulder, interrupting. Will, could you do me a favor and get some firewood? You know where we keep it. Will nods, accepting that he's been dismissed. As per usual, I'd like to address the quote from the top of the episode before anything else to hopefully set the tone for today's discussion. For those that don't recognize it, it's a short monologue from another one of my favorite films that I think is highly applicable for this series as a whole. It's from David Fincher and writer Steve Zalian's adaptation of Stieg Larsson's Men Who Hate Women, a.k.a. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. The entire speech is morbidly fascinating, But there's one line that really gets to the heart of what I hope to convey with this entire podcast. Quote, It's hard to believe that the fear of offending can be stronger than the fear of pain. But you know what? It is. End quote. If you've seen The Invitation and or have been following along with the podcast, I'm sure you already see the relevance. This is kind of a terrifying notion because there's enormous truth to it. The context as it relates to Dragon Tattoo isn't hugely important. The only thing you really need to know is that the protagonist, played by Daniel Craig, goes against his better judgment towards the end of the film because consciously or not, he adheres exactly to what his captor, played by Stellan Skarsgård, has just asserted. Daniel Craig thought being polite and socially acceptable would get him to safety in a very scary situation. Instead, it left him drugged and bound in a murder basement. As Phil Hay says on the Invitation's audio commentary, not wanting to be unacceptable can mute your survival, which is exactly what happens. Existing fans of the Invitation know how fatal this course of action, or inaction as it were, can be how dangerous it can be to weigh your manners over your survival instincts. Which brings us right back to Will, this very unlikely proxy for the audience, because he doesn't take the usual course of action or the usual course of passivity. He 
he's unlikely because frankly he's not very likable and he's not especially kind and not necessarily the kind of person we want to project ourselves on or see ourselves in. We loosely empathize with him because we know he's been through a tragedy and it's frightening aftershocks. Yet he's the exception, not the rule, in both the film as well as in real life. Most dinner parties and social gatherings are going to have an understood atmosphere of friendliness and revelry, and not repeated instances of undermining one's host, which Will is unhesitant and quick to do. Encountering a downer, for lack of a better term, is not what usually happens. And I don't even like using that word because it has a whole host of other implications that don't apply. Will isn't bringing up conspiracy theories apropos of nothing. He isn't crudely shoehorning in politics or the news into conversations. He's just trying to get through the night, which a lot of the time means keeping to himself. In fact, he seems to actively remove himself so as not to be an emotional burden on anyone. Just look at how the character of Claire, played by Maria Delfino, has to force him to sit down and ask about her. It's a commendable roll of the dice on behalf of the filmmakers to have a character like Will as the lead. As Karin Kasama says, to be the main character and to be recessive and paranoid, can you engage an audience in that struggle? I find that to be an impressive gamble to even attempt, let alone succeed in, but it's one that pays off and stays with you because of how refreshing and well-executed it is. Once more, it's a huge credit not just to the writing and direction, but to Logan Marshall Green, who transposes his usual charisma into a tense and righteous energy that seems to propel his performance through everything from quiet verbal sparring matches to explosive arguments to caustic vulnerability and breakdowns. We're treated to an unconventional guide through an emotional labyrinth, to a character who says the uncomfortable but true thing, which therefore gives us permission in a cathartic way to be that, to be the person who doesn't bite their tongue, but rather speaks their mind and says an important, maybe even vital truth, even if the cost is a series of dumbfounded looks from friends and a less fun party which in the extreme instance of the invitation is a best case scenario and isn't much of a cost at all in the grand scheme of things. Will may not be a character we aspire to be, but his brashness is therapeutic in that there's a universality to feeling isolated or like you're the only one losing your mind. As Karin Kasama says in her DGA interview from 2016, And so in some respects, this is also a little bit of a metaphor for me about um, what it means to feel like people are out to get you when sometimes they are. And, and, and so I, you know, for me, this was a, a cathartic, a very cathartic way to handle some of that anxiety because I think I, I, I think this is a, an industry that breeds it. And so it was very interesting to make a movie that was very viscerally about that paranoia. Mercifully at this juncture, some of that anxiety is briefly alleviated we start to see how Will is not completely alone in feeling how he does. In the last episode, we got confirmation from Ben that Eden and David had been acting off all night. And in today's, we get back up in the form of Claire, who echoes Will's own sentiments. Unlike Ben, though, she doesn't seem to be powering through with food and alcohol. Instead, she literally leans on Will and finds comfort in their shared discomfort. It's weird to be here, isn't it, she says. Yeah, it is, for every reason. It's a genuinely nice moment because it shows that Will has an ally. We know he has friends, he's surrounded by them, but we see a kindred spirit now, and maybe for the first time. Whereas, understandably, many of the other guests want to mask the pervasive heaviness and strangeness of the night with jokes, and laughter. Claire's a good foil to that. Her one-on-one time provides relief, which is what everyone seems to be looking for in Choi, 
the famously tardy friend who still hasn't shown up. The writers do a fantastic job of periodically reminding us of him, sprinkling in scenes like this that will cumulatively bring us to one of the emotional climaxes of the story. We think Choi may finally have arrived at the end of Will and Claire's conversation on the steps to hopefully break the spell of awkwardness and bring some fresh life to things, but it ends up being the opposite. It's another one of Eden and David's friends from Mexico, probably the last thing any of the guests wanted. A large, intimidating man named Pruitt. Unlike the skittish, wounded animal description of Sadie, the other friend from Mexico, Pruitt is immaculately introduced as a man with a sweet face, with the vibe of a reformed con who has found religion, which is almost exactly how the brilliant John Carroll Lynch seems to play him. Lynch, who many will recognize from his excellent turn in David Fincher's Zodiac, has said that Pruitt is the gentlest character he's ever played, which is a great insight, one that may seem contradictory upon learning more and more about his character, but absolutely tracks in every one of his mannerisms and deeper intentions. As we move ahead in the story, I'd highly recommend looking for this in all of his scenes. Questionable as his history may be, he is a true believer and is almost spiritually at peace. So when observing and thinking about this kind of thespian precision, it's really no surprise that Phil Hay and Matt Manfredi wrote the part for John Carroll Lynch. And the more I watch the film, the more trouble I have ever imagined another actor in the role. Pruitt is a huge presence, literally and narratively. He looms large. He is the mounting tension made flesh. He embodies all the nebulous, unknown details concerning Eden and David and Mexico. At a moment in the story when the audience craves relief and the characters crave familiarity, we only get more frustration. Who the hell is this guy? Where's Troy? What actually happened in Mexico? I thought this was an old friend's only party. The best part is that there's still nothing explicitly sinister happening, but by virtue of the fact that a painful and not too distant past hangs like a storm cloud over everyone, what might have been merely vexing under different circumstances now feels dangerous. And that feeling does not seem to be relenting, especially for Will, of course. One thing I love about today's scene is that, as much as it might feel like an interstitial, uneventful couple of pages of setup, it is one of the great examples of Will and David's conflict, because not only does it play out in front of the other guests, it shows how reasonable they're both being. They both have calm, fair explanations for their points of view, which is excellent because it leaves the audience squarely in a state of uncertainty, of who should we trust and believe. And that means the filmmakers have you exactly where they want you. I've said this before, but it's worth saying again. The first time I saw The Invitation, I obviously enjoyed it greatly, but it drove me crazy in the best way. I was practically shouting at my TV, dying for the other shoe to drop. At the time, I probably couldn't articulate exactly why, but now I think it's because scenes like this, where two diametrically opposed people express equal opposite arguments. It's deviously meant to place the viewer in Will's shoes. It's almost like involuntary empathy. Speaking for myself at least, I know that my first viewing of the film made me feel like I was going mad. And only upon reflection do I see how that is anything but a coincidence. It's by design. By stretching out the essential questions and delaying the climax, or climax is plural, in my opinion, as long as possible, Karn Kasama doubles down on her gamble with the main character. Just like she hopes audiences will stay engaged with him and his fragile mental state, she hopes audiences will stay engaged with the plot long enough not to feel let down or let astray when the curtain at last falls and everything's revealed. It's a high-risk, high-reward play, but again, it pays off because, to paraphrase Nicholas Winding Refn, director of Drive, violence is all about the build-up. It sounds like an oversimplification, maybe it is, but it really works in the case of The Invitation because that build-up is proportional. 
the greater the anticipation, the more powerful the arrival of violence is, whether that violence is verbal, physical, or otherwise. It can be, and usually is horrific, but its value is in letting the audience exhale. An indispensable part of that buildup is the aforementioned dialogue shared between Will and David. Will asks, why deadbolt the door? Which is doubly notable in conjunction with the bars on the windows that you may remember. Counterpoint from David. There were home invasions. I didn't hear about that, says Will. Then I'm sure it didn't happen, jokes Tommy, who is ever the diffuser and who I can't wait to talk about more in detail. What if there was a fire, says Will. Which you could say is his mic drop moment, because it's kind of inarguable, especially putting David on the spot in front of an audience of their peers. It's a good point, and reminds us that as unstable as Will might seem or might be, he's not all raw emotion. He's measured and logical, even if it's motivated by hurt. So David unlocks the front door, and Will wins this round. In a little bit of a hilarious fuck you moment, though, David gently reminds Will that this is his house now, and he runs it differently. Will may have got what he wanted, but David gets in the last word. It's the kind of perfectly dickish line that not only sneaks in a jab, but gives him carte blanche for any future disagreements between them. David can basically justify it with that same explanation from now until the end of the movie. There's also an eeriness to Ben's line, you guys should have a gun, after he seems to half-jokingly defend David's choice. For one, this line simply carries a lot more weight at the end of 2019 and at the end of this decade that has hosted so many mass shootings in America. On top of that, it's very foreboding, even independent of that fact. The locking of the door isn't even the only reasonable suspicion from this scene. Additionally, Will notices but doesn't confront David about the secretive cell phone call he takes. You could say that David is maybe just being considerate by not having this conversation out in the open where it's distracting or impolite. But soon after his call ends, Gina, Choi's significant other, asks if they have service. No, almost never, says David. It's another tally against the gracious host, but interestingly, Will seems to bank this observation. Maybe because David offers that the deck is a possible hotspot. Meanwhile, Gina says that Choi usually at least calls when he's going to be late. All of this will collectively inform how Choi, or lack of Choi, becomes an unexpected linchpin in audience and character allegiance. Where's Choi? Is he just more late than usual? Did something bad happen to him? Maybe something bad that no one's taking responsibility for? His absence is a ringing in Will's ears that will grow more and more unbearable. An excruciating tinnitus that will deafen him if it's never addressed. Invitation to the Invitation is written, produced, and hosted by me, Jim Panola. Original score is by John Panola. Follow us on Twitter at an invitation, no underscores. And follow us on Instagram at invitation to invitation. That's invitation, the number two, invitation with no underscores. Likewise, email us at invitation to invitation at gmail.com with questions and comments. Special thanks to the filmmakers and to the Panola family for their support. Please spread the word if you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time.